So Plato is dragging his kicking and screaming out of the cave, wanting us to know what is really real, wanting us to be able to see the difference between appearance and reality. Now to describe this difference between appearance and reality, well we have to start with appearance and then get to reality. And this is the four kinds of belief. And the first, or four kinds of knowledge I should say. And the first kind, uh, the book uses the term imaginings. And this is the, uh, basically just the perceptual content. So right now I'm hearing some bugs. I see greens and browns around me. I feel the heat and the light from the sun. Uh, I feel the uh, humidity of the air. This is all the perceptual content. If I were to, say, uh, go over to this tree right here, I feel the rough edge of the tree. If I even dare to try to chew some of this, I'm sure it would taste like something, but I'm not going to do that. So this is the first step in, in this knowledge. Now, to be clear, our knowledge is not just this step. Our knowledge is not just the perceptions. Right? That would be to halt the process altogether, to say that there's no difference between our perceptions and anything else. And right now, so there's no difference between perceptions and what we might call like real knowledge or knowledge of the real. We just say, well, that, that's just, you know, here's our perception, here's the knowledge of the real, right? Um, no, to say that, you know, there's, there's our perceptions and then there's more beyond that. Plato's taking a, a, a big kind of step here. Now, again, the book uses the word imagining. Uh, another word that might be useful, especially in our context, is imaging. So think about what's happening right now. I mean, the video is interpreting information and coding it on a disc to be, uh, uh, to be transferred to a player which produces uh, something very much like <laughs> the perceptual content that I'm having right now, right? Well, that, uh, that, you know, that, that's an imaging process. It's uh, giving the perceptual content. So that's the first step is imaging. Well, the next step, according to the book, is called belief or believing. Now, uh, you might wonder exactly what that believing is. Well, you know, take a look at your computer screen. Right? You're getting some uh, perceptual information right now. You're hearing a voice over the speaker. Now, ask yourself, are you thinking that that information is from your computer or is it from me? Um, I mean, in a roundabout way, you might say it's from me, but, you know, my I am not speaking in wherever you are viewing this video. I, I am not uh, in your study hall or in your living room or what have you speaking to you at the moment. Right? It's, technically speaking, it's the computer that's producing that sound right now, not me. Uh, where, for, for where I am, <laughs> the, uh, I am producing a sound of my vocal cords and the camera is recording it, so to speak. So believing is, is the idea that yes, there's this perceptual uh, information Right? There's sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell. But uh, that this perceptual information is coming from something. So one way to look at it, that you know, all that you're perceiving right now is coming from me and the trees and the, uh, uh, the, the bugs making the sound right now, my voice. Or another way to think about it is that the believing is from the computer itself. Right? So those are two different kinds of beliefs with the... With, uh, you know, something like the same perceptual information. Right? So with believing, you're moving from the shades, the shadows that are on the wall, right, the appearances, to uh, the, cut the cutouts. It's the uh, actual physical objects that are around you. Right? So in believing, I, 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 I see this, I feel it, all right? But what's... What the, you know, the step from, you know, the step from perceptual content to believing is there's something there that's involved, uh, uh, that, you know, that's somehow involved or causal related to my perceptual content. So with uh, imagining and believing, we're still dealing with the particular individual things. I am perceiving and having beliefs about this thing right here. Now, that's the interpretation, I'm sorry, that's the inspection. That's with the particular thing. Uh, the next step is the interpretation. What we had uh, talked about in class, uh, what we had practiced a little bit, trying to find the definition or the essence of this thing. 
And what do we call this? We call this a tree. Right? Specifically, this is a cedar tree. I could tell by the strippy kind of bark and the uh, needles, uh, a little bit by the structure of the trunk. All right, this is different from, I don't know if you can see this, from right back over there, we got some oak trees, right? Different kind of perceptual content. So when I am thinking, I've gone from the particular to the abstract. It's kind of like this first step. So I look at this and I say, this is cedar. This is cedar. I define it, um, you know, I abstract away from these particular things these particular cedar trees to the individual cedar trees to the form, the definition, the essence of cedar. Okay? So, you know, again, you go through the process of inspection to look at individual cedars and see what they have in common. Same thing with the oak. I go to the individual oak and I abstract away from the oak to find what they have in common. Uh, so, when I move from that See, from that tree right there, that individual thing right there, to cedar, I'm moving from believing to thinking. And that's where I've moved from that particular to the form. Now, it takes a lot of work, right? You, it, takes a lot of, it takes a lot of inspection to have really good interpretation. <coughs> so now, you know, now we're moving into, into interpretation, and this step of thinking is with the form of this particular of this individual tree. The next step is perfect intelligence. Now this is really involved. So let's start kind of from the ground up. Right? We start with um, imagining, right, the perceptual content. We go to believing, right? So we're going for the perceptual content, the first step of more reality. That's a concrete thing gone from the shadows to the cutouts, right? Then I go from the cutouts to the solid objects, right? So I go from this particular tree, this particular oak, to the form oak. Right? And then now in the in allegory of the cave, the next step was to go from the solid objects to the sun. And here's how that works. So I have this particular oak, and um, I've seen other oaks, and from that, I get the form oak. We've got that tree right there. I'm actually not sure what that is. <laughs> but I can see it's a different kind of tree than oak. Right. Um, I see the cedars behind it. Now, here's an oak. Um, I don't know what that is. Let's call it... Let's just call it pine for the sake of argument. It's not a pine, but let's call no, it's not, not a pine. Uh, let's call it an elm for the sake of argument. It's not an elm, but let's just call it an elm tree. And then back here we have cedar. So oak, uh, pine, I'm sorry, elm, and cedar. Right? What all three of these have in common is tree. These are all kinds of trees. Right? So I'm abstracting even further away. Not only do I see what oak hasn't, you know, what, what particular oaks have in common with oaks, but I see what oaks and elm and cedar all have in common, such that they are all tree. Uh, so these are, this is a relationship between the forms, uh, where uh, forms of uh, a particular things are grouped together, that's like the first step, and then these forms are grouped together. So we go from this oak to the form oak, alongside elm and cedar uh, to form tree. So that's an overall form for these. Now, there's more forms in, and there's more particular things in front of you, in front of the camera right now, right? So there's sunglasses, there's human being, there's hat. Now each of these has a form, the form of sunglasses. Even though this is like only one particular kind of sunglasses, there are, more than, there are more than these. So what is the definition of sunglass in general such that this is one of them? Right. And as you move up in this abstraction, you see how all the forms are related together. Now, here's the idea for Plato. The more you move up in abstraction, the more real 
you know, the more there's more reality that you know. Right? Perceptions are fleeting; they come and go. Right? They are uh, more fleeting than this particular oak tree. I can stop looking at the oak, but the oak is still there. Right? There's, <laughs> there's probably going to come a time where I cease to exist, but this oak continues to exist. And, you know, these uh, particulars exist for a very long time. All right, so the oak outlasts my perceptions. In the same way, the form of oak outlasts, you know, is, is uh, an eternal thing. It outlasts, it's more real than this particular oak tree. Because this oak tree, there's a point when this oak tree did not exist. There will be a point when this oak tree does not exist, but the form of oak will continue to exist. So what Plato wants us to see here is that the further up you move in abstraction, the more reality you're grasping. So we move up from oak and elm and cedar to tree. And we move up from tree to plant. We move up from plant to living things, so on and so forth, as we move on up in abstraction. When you see how all of this is related to each other, you understand reality. You understand existence. And that's what it means by perfect intelligence. Perfect intelligence in the, sense that, in the sense that is complete. Complete intelligence, complete knowledge. There's nothing for which you do not know. I imagine this is really hard for you to swallow. You're thinking, oh, well, what are these forms supposed to be? Right? They're more real than these things here. So can I you know, hold them? Can I interact with them? And you say that they're permanent. Does that mean that they're really hard and dense like the uh, Parmenian one? I think you are kind of missing the point here. Now, at this point, we're wondering what the forms are. Well, remember that little exercise we did in class? You know, when we looked at the squares, right? And we saw squares of different sizes, different colors, uh, different... Um, locations right? um, and when we were thinking about what makes a square a square it wasn't any one of those particular squares that's what they all had in common so there's this essence this definition of square and I asked you uh, to imagine this essence of square right so the, the essence of square is equilateral equiangular quadrilateral and I asked you to imagine that and you imagined it, or you tried, but what you got was a particular square. You didn't imagine equiangular, equilateral, quadrilateral. Maybe right now you're trying to do it and you see the words, but that's not the same thing. That essence, that form of square, is what you comprehend. It's not here, right? We move from inspection to interpretation. Well, what you comprehend uh, has no parts. This tree has parts. It has bark, it has sap, it has branches, it has needles, it has roots. If you start taking away the parts, you destroy the tree. The form of tree has no parts to destroy. It has, uh, it, it does not decay. It does not, um, it is not composed. It is an existing thing independent of this tree. Just like the essence of square is an existing thing independent of any particular square you imagine or draw or see. Now, since it has no parts, it cannot be destroyed, it cannot be created, Plato says these forms have always existed. They have always existed. They are permanent. They're eternal. And they're not eternal because they're incredibly dense and nothing can affect them. They're eternal because they're immaterial. Immaterial. They are not made of matter. Think back to the distinction that Pythagoras made between form and matter. These things are not material. They can't be composed. They can't decompose. So where are the forms where you're asking where the immaterial thing is? That's a nonsense question. Immaterial things don't have a location. So think about the number one. The number one is a form. It's immaterial. I can't hold the number one in my hand. 
I can hold individual things in my hand, but not the number one. I can hold up an individual finger, but that's not the number one. The number one doesn't come into existence or cease to exist with particular things. It's eternal, immaterial. So this question of where are the forms? Nowhere. They have no location. They're a separately existing thing. What are the forms? The immaterial. They are the essences. They are the essences of these particular things around us. They are permanent. Um, they're, now, they're related to each other and they're related to these things, but, they're, uh, but their existence does not depend upon these particulars, these concrete individual things. So now we might wonder, well, what's this relationship between the forms and these particular things? I mean, I, I can't interact with the forms. I can't hold them in my hand. They can't be created or destroyed. They're these permanently existing things, which are, you know, they're not dependent upon these things around us. So, I mean, why think that this is true? Well, look back at what Plato has to say. He says that, um, you know, the, the form of cedar and oak and elm, that these outlast these particular trees. Well, since they outlast them, uh, they're more real than the particular things. They're more permanent than these particular things. So here's, here's the first step in the claim, is that the forms are more real than these particular things. Now, another question is, um, you know, is there any relationship between the forms and these particulars, right? between the universal and the particular. And the idea is this, like, well, if the form has been around, you know, in a sense longer, it doesn't really make sense to say it that way, but, you know, since the forms are permanent and eternal, and these things come and go, you know, the idea is um, that somehow the forms uh, 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 are responsible for the existence of these particular things. Now, you know, there's one or two ways you can go. You can either say, look, you know, the forms are permanent, these particular things are not. The particular things come and go. Well, the question is, well, where do the particular things come from? You could say they're either spontaneous or that they come from something more real. You can't, I mean, if you try to say they come from something less real, that's like saying that the trees come from my uh, pictures of the trees, my imaginings of the trees. That's, no, that, that's not going to do it, because <laughs> there's lots of things I imagine that don't actually exist. Um, so, in, so, you know, the other option is to say that the particulars just spontaneously come into existence. Well, that's not really going to work in a Greek mindset, because that's creating more problems than, uh, than solving them. Right? And the Greeks are real interested in trying to unite everything. So, instead of saying that they're spontaneous, it's like, well... The, these particular things, they must come from something else. They're not going to come from something less real. They're going to come from something more real. So, these particular trees right, all come from, somehow, come from the form tree. And there's lots of language that's used to describe this. Um, the forms cause the trees. Don't think of it in your sense of cause. Right? Um, we think very mechanical um, you know, <laughs> very mechanical sense of causation where we're dealing with, uh, shall we say, the transfer of uh, energy from one, uh, uh, from one piece of matter to another, something like that. That's not what they're talking about. They're thinking more along the lines of terms of um, explanation or um, origin. Right? So yeah, one way to describe it is that these particular things are caused by the forms. Another way to say it is that these particular things participate in the forms. So this raises a lot of questions for Plato. This is kind of a difficulty. But the point, but the point to remember for Plato here is that these particular things, all these particular things, they in somehow, somehow depend on the forms for their existence. They depend on the forms for their existence. So we have this idea that these concrete, these particular things, depend on the forms for their existence. And that is supposed to give something of an explanation 
of the relationship between particular things and the forms. Well, what's the relationship between the forms? Well, look at what's happening here. We can start to see a pattern for Plato that each of these particular things, right, all the particular cedar, uh, depend upon the one form of cedar. And all the elm depend upon the one form of elm. And all the uh, uh, um, oak depend upon the one form of oak. Well, keep going. The form cedar and oak and elm, they depend upon the one form of tree. So we keep uh, uh, having this dependence under a hierarchy. And tree um, falls somewhere along, you know, there's probably a few steps in between, but tree is going to be under plant. Keep going, you know, plant under living thing. So this dependence of the particular on the form continues from the more specific form to the more general form. The specific forms are cedar, elm, and oak. The more general form is tree. Next, you know, we have tree and say bush and ivy, and they fall under the more general form of plant. And it keeps going and going. Now, where does that lead? That is a really interesting question. So, without a doubt, these forms are seeming very spooky to you. You're wondering how we come to know these things to begin with. Well, that's a really interesting question. Um, if you think about what's going on here, as Plato describes it, then, you know, this part's pretty accurate, where we start with the perceptual content, the imaginings. And we go from there to belief. Now, you may not think that that's such a huge step, but, you know, if our brain was not wired the way it was, we wouldn't naturally make that step. There are people who can't make the step from perceptual information to belief that there's objects out there. Um, and you might say that, uh, you know, push it even further, you, know, you might say, okay, well, maybe you could talk about this form thing, but I'm not really buying it. Um, it's like, well, Plato would say, you're, you're already using the language anyway. When you walk out here, you do not say, hey, look at that and 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 that. No. You look out and you say, look at the trees. You're dealing with a form. You're dealing with an abstract, an essence, a definition, a meaning. So you already, Plato's going to say, you're already committed to this idea. How do you know about these? Well, it's, it's difficult because we are going from perceptual to believing and then from believing to form, and then form to, you know, sorry, uh, believing to, to thinking, and then thinking to perfect intelligence. Many of the ways that we think already do this. Right? We're already committed to this kind of idea. We're trying to unify everything under one. And, you know, not just material objects, but uh, uh, concept, you know, concepts as well. So, uh, how does this come about? Because, frankly... The minute you move from perceptual content, you are no longer dealing with perceptual content. The minute you move from perceptual content to say, yeah, that thing right there, you have left perceptual content, you're doing something else. And even more so, when you move from that thing right there, which is uh, believing, to thinking, you again have left perceptual content. Think about when you're dealing with the squares. When you have finished looking at the individual squares, and you, and you define them all under the term square, the essence square, you're not dealing with perceptual content. The essence or the form of square does not look like any particular square. So the minute we leave perceptual content, right, the question is, well, how do we know about this? That's a great question. Um, Plato had three things. He suggested three things. One, you know, first and foremost, is recollection. Not creating. <laughs> these forms. We don't create the forms with our minds, right? We remember the forms with our minds. And the, uh, the idea there is, is that at one point our souls were disembodied and they were with the forms. Uh, you probably don't like that explanation, but we'll, you know, we'll discuss a little bit in class. The other way to know the form is through dialectic, 
But again, I think Plato's going to push on this and say, yeah, you know, through, through dialectic, we're comparing notes with one another, but we're still ultimately going to rely, rely upon recollection because we're going to have to rely on, you know, our knowledge of the forms to be able to identify that these individual things are trees to begin with, which is an essential part of dialectic. The last way we come to know about these things is probably the most interesting, through desire, through love. You might wonder, how is this supposed to work? Well, you know, think about when you're falling in love with a person. I mean, that, that's a way to start. When you fall in love with a person, um, what you get is a perceptual content first. <laughs> you know, we don't have access to each other's minds, right? We hear voices, we uh, see facial expressions, we, uh, you know, we, you know, we spend time and we have experiences with the person. That's inspection. The interpretation is when we start to try to um, understand what the intentions are what the desires are. That, we don't see intentions here. You infer the intentions. And the reason why you do that is, is out of love. Because you want, not necessarily romantic love, but you know, love and care for the person. That you know, you're going from the particular things to, to you know, the not particular things. I mean, to, to really what is the content or the meaning or the essence of this person. Well, the same thing happens with with us when we're just looking around. I mean, look what happens with, with humanity. Inevitably, once humanity starts encountering the world after you know, trying to solve such problems as how to live until tomorrow, start, start to wonder, what's all this around us? What is this reality? And it's that desire to know. It's that desire to know what reality is. That's what impels us to understand the form, to understand these universals. Right, so we do start with trees. Right? We do start with you know, individual. You know, we do start with cedars and elms and and uh, and um, uh, uh, oaks, and we move from there to trees to know more, to get to plants, to get to living. So it's this desire to know, and probably most importantly, when you step out here, you see beauty, and beauty is something we want, something we crave. If we don't experience beauty in our lives, we, we're really miserable. So from, the, from this beauty, right, we have this desire to know. From the beauty of the trees, we want to know the trees. From the beauty of all this around us, we want to understand all this around us. So that's, those are the three main ways that we come to know us, through recollection, through dialectic, and through desire.